Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spiritual Wanderlust podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Deutsch. And today, well, really recently, I've had mystics on my mind. We've been going through this women mystic school, and it's been so fun digging into all these different mystical writings. And so I'm extra excited to speak with the spiritual theologian Matthew Fox today, who has contributed quite a lot to the resurgence of interest in mystical Christianity. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with Matthew, he is a popular teacher and retreat leader and activist and has written over three dozen books, including The Original Blessing, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, A Spirituality Named Compassion, The Hidden Spirituality of Men, Christian Mystics, and many more. So I'm very excited to have him on the show today. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Thank you for the work you're doing in, in uh, bringing the mystics alive. Yes, absolutely. It's a wonderful thing to be a part of. <laughs> I'm glad you have mystics on your mind. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I was curious, Matthew, if you'd start us off today just by sharing how you came to discover the mystics, because there are millions of Christians who are completely unaware of even having a mystical tradition within Christianity. And even those of us who are in you know, monasteries or convents aren't always well formed in it. So I'm curious how it came across your radar in the first place. Well, when I was doing my studies with the Dominicans in the early 60s, um, I went to my superiors one day and said, look, I said, uh, my generation is going to be less interested in religion and more interested in spirituality. And of course, spirituality is the experience side of theology. Mm. And I said, and we, we're not, we don't have a single course here in spirituality. Now we're, we're trying to live it and and all that, but we don't have a course about it and about the mystics. We didn't have a single course on the mystics in my training. And um, and I said, so send someone on to get a doctorate in spirituality. And I said, I'm, I'm happy to volunteer. <laughs> so a couple of years later, they came back to me and said, well, good news. You can, the provincial council says you can go to go to Europe and get a doctorate in spirituality. And then, then we thought about where to go. And I wrote Thomas Merton and asked him, where would, should I go? And Thomas Merton sent out, and my, the Dominicans thought I was crazy to write him, but I'd never hear from him. Four days later, I got a full page letter saying, go to the Institut Catholique in Paris. And so I showed it to them and said, so now I know where I have to go. Oh, no, they said, we can't send you to France. I said, why not? We never sent anyone to France who came home again, they said. <laughs> Everyone wants to stay. Exactly. So so it was like a standoff for two months. I kept hitting him over the head with Merton's letter. And finally, they said, OK, get out of here. Go to Paris. Then, of course, years later, they regretted that I did come home. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> but um, but um, I, uh, I mean, the mystics are poets and uh, poets of the soul. And uh, I was drawn to them, of course. And um, uh, but I'll tell you, like Meister Eckhart, who's one of the greatest of the mystics of the West and was a Dominican, I never heard his name once in all my 10, 10 years of training as a Dominican. Uh, but I discovered Eckhart this way. I'd published a couple of books and then I read a wonderful essay by Kumar Swami, the Hindu scholar uh, on um, nature and spirit and so forth and uh in it was a chapter in Eckhart I, I read that chapter and I said oh my god there were sentences from Eckhart that I had published in an article that year I couldn't believe it it, it scared me I put the yeah. book on the shelf and then a couple of months later I gingerly tipped over to the book again and finished that article and, that was, and then I had a conversion like oh here's a buddy here's a friend uh I want to know Eckhart better then I had an operation from a serious car accident. And during the operation, Eckhart came to me. And we were walking together on the beach. It was the most transcendent dream of my life. And we didn't say anything. There was just silence. But I, when I came out of my ether or whatever it was, I said to a friend who was at the bedside, uh, I've just been walking with Magister Eckhart on the beach. And that's when I really plunged into Eckhart. And then he brought me to Hildegard and... Um, and the gang, <laughs> Julian <laughs> Norwich. And of course, Aquinas I had studied for years with the Dominicans, but they never mentioned his mystical side. I mean, they never did anything with it. They have mentioned, oh, he was also a mystic, but no one had developed it. And they didn't know what questions to ask. And um, 
notice, even in trying to study mysticism, I had to go to France. I couldn't, hmm. you know, Merton didn't recommend any university in the United States. He did mention uh, McGill in Canada. Hmm. But, um, you know, the, the American church has been much more pragmatic, I guess you might say. But as you say, we've missed a depth dimension to um, who Jesus was, who was a mystic and a nature mystic, a creation mystic, out of the wisdom tradition of Israel, which is creation spirituality, pure and simple, and, and the prophetic tradition, which is part of creation spirituality. And it was in Paris that I met my mentor, Pere Chenou, a wonderful 75-year-old Dominican at the time. It was the last year of teaching that. And he named the creation spiritual tradition and the fall redemption tradition. And for me, that was like Paul fa falling off his horse. It just answered all my questions because I was there in, in the late 60s. And the big question in my mind was, what's the relationship between mysticism and social justice? Is it a relationship? Because I didn't see anyone making the connection. And Chanu answered it for me. In the far redemption tradition, there is no connection. It's dualistic, and they don't want to connect the prophetic. And, the, and, the, and they talk about purgation, illumination, and union. But I found... The four paths of creation spirituality, which I found in Eckhart, uh, they absolutely marry social justice with uh, mystical spiritual grounding. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's been my work ever since. Yeah, <clears throat> and I find that really interesting head. because you'll find, at least, you know, having come from the Catholic tradition myself, like they'll speak frequently of the contemplative and the active being mm -hmm. married together, but I feel like it's also somewhat rare, except maybe in more progressive circles to actually see that incarnate, you know, it's like, on the one side, you get maybe some people maybe you got some Carmelites or something who are actually talking about the contemplative tradition. And then you have some people who are doing social justice, but maybe don't have that deep rootedness in the mystical or in you know, the spiritual life, really. Why do you suppose that is why? Why do we separate them so much? Well, for one thing, I think it's part of the modern consciousness and part of the age of Pisces, mm -hmm. the age of Pisces through which the Christian church has existed exclusively until our lifetimes, the age of Aquarius. Uh, Pisces uh, is symbolized by two fish swimming in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of dualism in the age of Pisces and in obviously modern consciousness because modern consciousness, uh, Descartes, I think therefore I am, what? You think your thinking makes you exist? I apologize, but there's 13.8 billion years of history that have brought you here, Mr. Descartes, and made life possible on the planet. So really, let's get out of that egoism. So I think that's one of the reasons. The other is political, of course, that um, politicians don't want to hear about love and compassion and justice. It can often be, a, a, uh, I mean, some do, but many don't. Uh, those who represent those who are doing very well in the present system, in the building of empires, uh, they don't want to hear about original blessing. They want to hear about original sin. Mm. They don't want to hear about the empowerment of creativity, that everyone is an image and likeness of God, and therefore has something to, to share. And, um, uh, and they don't want to hear about justice and compassion. They want to hear about charities and um, non profit tax uh, write-offs, but uh, they, you know, and so like Thomas Merton, you know, for 18 years in the monastery, he wrote exclusively really about contemplation and all that, and he did a good job. But in 1958, he met Suzuki, the Zen Buddhist who brought from Japan, who brought Zen Buddhism to America. And Suzuki said, you have to read your one Zen thinker of the West, Meister Eckhart. Mm. And Merton said, well, he was condemned by the church. And says, so, I can't help that. <laughs> so Merton sat down and started to read Eckhart. Because until then, he was very suspicious of Eckhart. Because you see, Eckhart was condemned a week after he died in, in the 14th century under a very corrupt pope. And, um, and as a result, he, he banished, essentially, from the theology. Philosophers took him up, but not theologians. But the point is that um, he converted Merton to being a, just a contemplative and dualistic, hmm. an Augustinian-based monk full of guilt and shame, 
to being a prophetic Christian. So the last 10 years of his life, from 58 to 68, Merton was a different person. You can see it in the, the titles of his books. He's mm -hmm. writing about war and peace. He's writing about the Vietnam War. He's writing about women's rights. He's writing about indigenous rights, about the genocide toward the American Indian and all this. All this prophetic vocation of his came flowing out, and it was all due to Eckhart. And he said that in his, he said Eckhart in, in his Asian journal, writing it on the side, he would say, Eckhart is my lifeboat. Eckhart is my lifeboat. And um, his second to last book uh, is on uh, Zen and the Bird of Appetites is all Eckhart and Suzuki. So he's bringing mm -hmm. East and Western mysticism together there too. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example of someone who did integrate it. But again, it's Eckhart who's so at the, um, at the, the, the core of bringing justice and spirituality together justice the mystical and the prophetic is, is the language i use and i think that's appropriate language because it's mm. quite uh, it's as 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 jewish scholars have told me the four paths that we lay out are jewish therefore they're biblical therefore jesus knew them jesus never heard of original sin never heard of it it was first used in the fourth century, the same century the church inherited the empire by St. Augustine. So whereas original blessing, the Jews jump on that. They get that. Reread Genesis 1. It's all about goodness. Blessing is, is just another word for goodness. The whole goes through all the creation. It's all good. And at the end, when humans arrive, it's very good. It, you know, the sin thing, that comes later. But first comes the via positiva. And religion when it's bought by empires, doesn't want to talk about the via positiva that much. It wants you to, to um, get on your knees and um, obey, whether it's the empire asking you to obey or whether it's uh, religion asking you to obey. It doesn't encourage creativity, the via creativa, and therefore not the via transformativa, because the prophets were all creative. Mm. And um, they were all artists in their way. Even Gandhi and King, I used to call them social artists because they organized the anger of the people. And instead of it venting and, mm. and being destructive, the nonviolent approach is to organize, to fill the jails, to do the marching, to march to the sea. Um, and um, that's, that's prophetic because it is interfering, but it's also mystical. Mm. So... Um, to me, spirituality is both the mystical, the mystic in us, which is the lover, that side of us that says yes to life, and the prophet, which says no to injustice. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that balance of both that makes us adults spiritually. Contemplation alone is not enough. And it, it, you can get very con comfortable being a contemplative. Um, but stepping out, think of Thich Nhat Hanh, a saint that has just passed. Uh, he was both. He, he had to invent a new word, engaged Buddhism, mm -hmm. because in his tradition, too, it was, uh, after all, he broke with his own country about the war, the Vietnam War. He was against both the North and the South. That really made him a lot of friends. Uh, he had to leave because of that. But um, so the, the prophet is, is the mystic in action, William Hawking says. The mm -hmm. prophet is the mystic in action. So it is that love that you learn in contemplation that um, sets a fire in you, mm -hmm. that you're willing to take on forces that that are are dangerous, large forces like like King did, and like Jesus did, mm -hmm. and like Merton did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're really well known for this creation spirituality that you've mentioned a few times. And for people who are not familiar with that, I mean, you've explained a little bit of it, like in Genesis and the original blessing, but how would you describe it in a couple sentences for people who are unfamiliar with that and how it might be distinct from especially the form of Christianity that they've received? Mm -hmm. Well, the form of Christianity that most people have received, unfortunately, is what Shanu, and Shanu was a great church historian, um, he was very important at the Second Vatican Council, uh, but he was silenced by Pope Pius XII for, I think, 12 years, forbidden to write, because he was working with the Marxists after the war, and, um, and he was reinventing the education for priests, for Dominicans, 
and it was too much for Rome to take in the 40s and 50s. But um, Chanu says there are two traditions in the West. One is fall redemption, begins with the fall, and then everything else is about redemption. Mm. And that's, the do- that's become the dominant version of Christianity since the Black Death, since the 14th century. And that's why Julian Norwich is so important. She's mm. sitting over my shoulder here. Um, because she lived through the Black Death. And yet she stayed absolutely true to the, to the other tradition of spirituality, which is older, because it's in um, uh, Genesis 1. It's in the first author of the Bible, the J source. And, um, and uh, the Jewish tradition it talks, talks about sin, of course, but it doesn't begin with it. Mm-hmm. It begins with what I have called original blessing. Aquinas has a phrase, original grace, mm. which is beautiful, and original goodness. He has a phrase, original goodness, which is wonderful. It's the same thing as original blessing, mm. though I got condemned for original blessing, and he didn't, but what can you say? Um, there were better theologians in the 13th century than in the 20th in the, in the Vatican. But um, uh, so the... the uh, the original blessing or Christ spiritual tradition is the oldest tradition in the Bible is the tradition of Jesus. Why? We now know that Jesus comes from the wisdom tradition of Israel and the prophets, but the wisdom tradition includes the prophets. Uh, wisdom is a friend of the prophets, says the wisdom teachings in the Hebrew Bible. So that means Jesus comes from the creation spiritual tradition because that is finding God in nature. There are many scholars who believe that Jesus was forbidden to attend the synagogue on the Sabbath because he was considered illegitimate. Therefore, when others went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, he went out to nature. Mm -hmm. And check it out how much of his teaching, all of his parables are saturated in his keen observations about sparrows that fall from trees and and seeds that grow, mustard seed and big trees and little trees and the sheep and the goats and the lilies of the field. I mean, he's saturated. And of course, he was a peasant farmer. His family was a peasant farmer and he was a craftsman. His father taught him the the trade of wood carving. So um, that's who he was. And of course, he was a parable maker. He was an artist, therefore. He was a storyteller and a great artist. He did, you know, he didn't go through a seminary and he, he, he was most likely illiterate, in fact. He wasn't busy reading. He was very busy hearing and observing and listening to people's stories and suffering and, and the rest. So um, this is tradition of Jesus, but it's also a tradition of all these great mystics. And especially, and of course, the Celtic tradition. The Celts settled down the Rhineland and all the way into northern Italy, which is why we have Francis of Assisi, and into northern Spain, which is why we have St. Dominic. And, um, and, and I, I call Hildegard of Bingen, because she lived most of the 11th century, um, or excuse me, the 12th century, the 1100s. Um, she, I call her the grandmother of the Rhineland mystic movement, hmm. because she was the first, if you will, um, since the Scotus Original, the 9th century theologian who was Celtic, who, who taught in Europe. But then after Hildegard, two years after Hildegard died, was born Francis of Assisi. Mm. Well, he's creation center. And then following him was uh, Thomas Aquinas. He was creation centered. He says, the most excellent thing in the universe is not the human. The most excellent thing in the universe is the universe itself. Mm. That's from a doctor of the church. And then comes Mechtel de Magdeburg, who was a Beguin. And that was a women's movement of the 13th century. And they were hounded and screamed at by men all over. The Pope condemned them 17 different times because they were women who did not choose to get married and did not choose to live as nuns. At that time, a nun had to be behind a cloistered wall. They lived in the cities, especially with the people, especially the young, uh, serving the young. They didn't live with them. They lived with each other. But... um, she was a Beguine and hounded a lot. And then comes Meister Eckhart, who was very close to the Beguines. The Beguines, in fact, wrote down his sermons in German. That's where you have his sermons. Hmm. And um, uh, he was condemned by the same Pope who condemned the Beguines 17 times. 
John the 22nd. But that was a week after uh, Eckhart died. Hmm. And then after Eckhart comes Julian of Norwich. So there's this incredible lineage. And then comes a black death. And you see, Julian was seven when the bubonic play hit for the first time. And then it kept running back in waves her entire lifetime. She lived into her 80s. And everyone else was freaking out about, you know, God is trying to punish us for our sins. That's why the plague is here, they said. And others said, you know, it's nature's bad and all this. She reinforces the, the beauty and the goodness. And she says, God is the goodness in nature. God is the goodness in nature. And um, the dualism of St. Augustine and the original sin and the fall redemption tradition came back in, in a wave, you see, during the bubonic plague. They had no scientists to promise a vaccine or explain where it comes from. They didn't have a word for virus. So they were all upset. So Thomas Berry, the great geologian, says that the creation, what killed creation spiritual in the West was the bubonic plague. Mm. Now, after the 14th century, everything was about the fear of death and the fear of nature. It was no longer about finding God in nature, which is where Jesus found God and where Christian spirituality finds God. But it's about uh, the fear of nature and the fear of death. And you see this in the 16th century with the Reformation, not only the Reformation, but the counter-Reformation from the Catholics. Uh, none of them are talking about, about creation. Now, John the Cross is as a mystic and as a poet, but he stands alone almost in that. Mm. And so, so much of religion in the West since the 14th century has been this depressing redemption thing um, and not about the, the theophany, the mm. God experience that nature can be. And, and then, of course, there was a split with, with science in the 17th century. And I ascribe that to the, the moment, really, when the church burned Giordano Bruno at the stake. What was the issue? Who was Giordano Bruno? He was a Dominican, like Eckhart, like Thomas Aquinas, like myself. <laughs> and he was burned at the stake. Why? Because he, he was preaching Copernicus, mm. a scientist of his day, just like Aquinas was preaching Aristotle, the scientist of his day, who had just been discovered but in Europe. Thanks to the Muslims, by the way, you translated him in Baghdad and into Latin, and thereby he came into Spain and then into Europe. But um, uh, so Bruno was, was burned at the stake because of his affirm affirmation of science. And um, so I think there was like a truce. The, sci the scientists said, hey, these believers are kind of scary. Like, they not only burned him at the stake, they cut his tongue out first. They tortured him. And so, um, and that was done in the Jubilee year of 1600 and by the Inquisition, and Cardinal Bellarmin actually was behind it. And um, so the scientists said, let's make a truce with the believers. Why don't you guys take the soul and we'll take the cosmos? Oh, goody, goody, said all these people trained by Augustine that nature is all fallen anyway. Who gives a darn about nature? Uh, and so, uh, living out that dualism, they say, oh, we'll take the soul. Well, what's happened since? Since we've had this schizophrenic homo sapiens, where you have the scientists discovering the power of the universe and then turning to turn it into nuclear weapons and, and machines that can deliver them. So that's pretty darn sc scary. And then we've had religion becoming more and more silly and more and more introspective mm. and really sick just this week there is a thing about i mean it's funny but it's unbelievable a priest in a parish in phoenix turns out when he was baptizing children for years he said we baptize in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and now now the bishop has kicked him out of his parish and he has to do penance and now they wonder they're saying and then the cdf from rome has chimed in i said oh my god oh they're, they're losing their minds over this no one's been baptized and people have been married it doesn't mean they it means their marriages aren't real uh priests are not real priests they have to be reordained because of this and they go through the whole thing and it's just it's so crazy right because he like said meanwhile, the magic spell wrong <laughs> the world is burning meanwhile there are other important things going on i don't think 
God gives a damn whether you say the word I or we. Furthermore, the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, accepts the baptism of Orthodox. They've never baptized with those words. They have a different baptismal thing. And the same with Protestants, which the Catholic Church also recognizes. So the whole thing is, it just shows to me the, for, for the sickness of an organization that has lost its roots and in, in the mystical uh, truths that Jesus taught and that other mystics have built their lives on and that we're all invited to participate in. Mm. So um, meanwhile, though, the good news is that science has thrown over the mechanistic view of the world that it had during the modern era and the dualistic view. And frankly, there are a lot more scientists today who are mystics, and I have met a lot of them, than there are bishops. Mm. And um, so the truth is that, that um, science and spirituality are linking up again in our time. And quantum theory and all the rest is rediscovering not only the, the mystery of the universe, but the beauty, of course. And now this mm. new telescope, the web telescope, the new creation story, all of it feeds our sense of awe and wonder gratitude and reverence, which is the via positiva of the mystics. It's the first stage of mysticism. As Rabbi Hesse says, uh, awe is the beginning of wisdom. Mm. And if we can move as a species from knowledge to wisdom, which means from the exclusive patriarchal and masculine to a balanced feminine and a healthy masculine, we may save ourselves. But mm. that, to me, that's our, our last hope as a species. And yeah. One thing I've been meditating on a lot lately is they're discovering all these cousins of ours. You know, we've heard about Neanderthals because they were from Europe. But um, and then we've heard the Denizens and, and they were part Europe, Siberian, so forth. But now in Southeast Asia, they discovered 12 more of our cousins, you know, and, and that is, of course, hominids like us who are really just. But the point is, we now have 14 by name that I know of anyway, and we're discovering more all the time. But the point is, the bottom line is, they're all extinct, except us. 13 are gone. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, and we're facing our own extinction. I, I think that information we're getting puts our, this context of our species and its religions and its education and its, its uh, empires and all that into context that, you know, we, the odds are that we'll go the way of other hominids. They all had failures and didn't make it. And uh, we, we've been, you know, very resilient and very um, successful as a, as a species for 300,000 years, but Hey, we're, we're on the verge of, of, of ending it all. Mm. And when religion gets all tied up and whether you say I or we and freak out and, Oh my God, it's, 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 it's really, it's a joke. It's, but it's a scandal too, tremendous scandal. And it shows the, the sickness right. of the institution of religion. And why so many young people are just turning their back on it. The more important things to worry about. Yeah. You know, I was going to say, I like, I feel like those who are, who are listening can probably relate to a lot of that. The, you know, following the, the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law, where it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. make sure you do things right. And like, you know, I, there yeah. are just so many pieces there that something interiorly says, like, really? Is this, yeah, exactly. is this really what it's all about? <laughs> you you know, like, yeah. is meanwhile, this really, there are people starving, and, you know, the planet. Oh, and my God. Just, oh. Yeah, there's so many other things going on that seem more. And Paul himself, who was a great mystic, said the letter kills, the spirit mm -hmm. gives life. Mm -hmm. like you say that's the literalism mm -hmm. and uh it's taken over so much it's not just religion that's suffering from this i think a lot of the legal profession is about nitpicking and and you know is very distant from justice yeah it, it wants to claim it's close to justice but rarely is it i think it's it's a game that lawyers yeah. play a one-upmanship and it's part patriarchy i i see is the problem yeah, you talk to about original sin. I think it's patriarchy. Yeah, I was going to say, talk to me a little bit about the relationship of patriarchy with kind of this fallen redemption schema mm. versus creation spirituality. Like, what? How do they relate to one another? Well, you know, <clears throat> also, you see, 
contemplation, I think, I would call the more feminine dimension of religion. It's about silence. It's about receiving. It's the via negativa. And, um, and therefore, it's about darkness and, and um, union, mm. profound union and silence. And, um, and also art. Because as I tell my students, there are two responses to mystical experience. One is silence, and the other is creativity, mm -hmm. or to art. So you want to dance, you want to sing, you want to write a play, poetry. You put, you know, that's the via creativa. Mm -hmm. You know, my striker says, I once had a dream, even though a man, I was pregnant, pregnant with nothingness. And out of the nothingness, God was born. Mm. That says so much. It says, it's talking about the via negativa, the nothingness experience. But it's also talking about the via creativa. So the via negativa mm. precedes the via neg uh, creativa. And um, it's like mind emptiness has to precede mindfulness. And um, so we have to calm the mind. And, and that's what meditation contemplation does, I think. It calms the reptilian brain. Because the reptilian brain and I'm getting to patriarchy. I think it's the basis of patriarchy. A reptile, with a reptile, it's win moves. You don't compromise with a with an alligator or a crocodile. You know, it's win lose. They're not real good at bonding with their own children, but they're very good with uh, lying in the sun alone. Uh, alligators like to do that a lot, and and so do snakes and others. So I think they're very good at at um, at contemplation then, mm -hmm. because uh, the word monk, monos, means solitude. Mm -hmm. So the, our reptilian brain is very susceptible to solitude. This is how you calm your reptilian brain. Nice crocodile, nice crocodile. That's what meditation does. Mm -hmm. And that's so important because uh, the reptilian brain is 420 million years old. Our mammal brain is exact half, 210 million. Now, all the great spiritual teachers, Jesus and Isaiah and Buddha and Lao Tzu and, and uh, Chief Seattle and Black Elk and Dorothy Day, they're all calling us to compassion. Mm -hmm. Compassion is a mammal thing mm -hmm. because the very words in Hebrew and Arabic for compassion comes from the word for womb. So the womb people are the mammals. Mm -hmm. So this is what all the great teachers are telling us. You're capable, and Jesus, Luke 6, be you compassionate like you're created in heaven is compassionate. So it's, an, it's such a universal idea. The Dalai Lama says we can do away with our religion, but we can't do away with compassion. Mm -hmm. Compassion is my religion. That's a quote from Dalai Lama. Oh, that's Jesus 626 and Matthew 25 and all the rest. It, it permeates his teaching. Mm -hmm. And in the Jewish tradition from which Jesus derives, of course, compassion is the secret name for God. But Jesus let that secret out of the bag in Luke mm. 6. Mm. So my point is that patriarchy is built on the reptilian brain. It's I win, you lose. That's the definition of patriarchy. And Rosemary Ruther says it's built on dualism. And she is, of course, one of the pioneers of, of feminist theology. She says that um, patriarchy's essence is dualism. And that's where you have St. Augustine and and fall redemption religion you're saved or you're not and you only can be saved in this way and not that way and all the rest and um but that's not how how the world is it's not how the universe or cosmos is mm. um and um so the 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 patriarchy has served the interests of empire um and patriarchy came along from the best we know, around 4,500 BC. Uh, for thousands of years before that, they were basically goddess civilizations and they were not built on conquering other people. And um, in fact, we, we find no weapons in these ancient structures from that era when, when the goddess reigned, when the, when the mother reigned. And uh, what we do see are thousands of statues of, in fact, I have one here that someone sent me, of the pregnant, whoops, of the pregnant goddess. Mm -hmm. Thousands of these. And um, men say, oh, it was all about orgies. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't. Marisa Gabutas, the great archaeologist, points out, it was about honoring creativity, not just in the female, but in the male too. That's what the green man archetype is all about. How, um, 
how men too are generative like nature is. And, um, and uh, so it's honoring the via creativa is honoring. And that is biblically, of course, honoring our, our being the image and likeness of God, mm -hmm. that we are co-creators with God. And that word is actually used by St. Paul. And um, so that's the via creativa. So um, patriarchy resists the, and of course wants to banish the strong feminine. There's a br brilliant book that came out several years ago by one of the founders of chaos theory, a mathematician who teaches Santa Cruz, University of Santa Cruz. I've done some um, work with him and it's on, uh, it's called Gaia, Eros and, um, Gaia, Eros and um, something else. But um, he traces a history of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And he points out that under the goddess times, one of the goddesses was chaos. Chaos was honored as a goddess. But when patriarchy took over in around the fifth century, well, 5,000 BC, um, uh, this empire thing happened. And of course the cities happened because agriculture was, was building up and all that. And the warrior thing happened. But what the important thing was the myths were changed. No longer was chaos a goddess. Now she was the enemy. And it was the masculine rulers of these new kinds of communities that had to control the goddess chaos. Mm. And he said, um, religion picked up on that and religion became patriarchal and it had to control the goddess and, and women because women represented uh, chaos because birthing was so chaotic. And, and creativity disturbs things. And he said, this went on for centuries until the 18th century, science said to religion, we're smarter than you guys, we'll take over and we'll start, we'll control chaos. And so it did until the 1960s when chaos theory came through in science and this just flipped science mm -hmm. that, oh, wait a minute, nature itself has all this chaos going on. For example, the imperfection of the planets in their ellipses. Um, or of course the weather, that there's chaos built into all of nature. Now we did a workshop uh, 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 yeah, together at a you know, UU church once, he and, and I, and, um, and, and he talked about chaos and science and I talked about the via negativa in, in mysticism and, and the, the dark night of the soul and that's all chaos. And uh, afterwards a woman came up to me, she said, I'm a midwife. She said, nothing is more chaotic than birth. She said, there's blood all over the world, walls. She said, it's a mess. But out of it, and she held her hands like this, out of it comes this wonderful living being. Mm. And it just hit me so hard, so strong, that this is the basic battle going on in the mind of patriarch. It's about control. It's mm. always about control. Look at these laws going on in Texas and everything in the Supreme Court about who's going to tell women what to do with their bodies. You know, it's where does this come from? This is where it comes from, mm -hmm. that uh, patriarchy is built on dualism, it's built on control, it's built on the reptilian brain. Mm -hmm. And this is where contemplation, which gets us beyond the reptilian brain, is so important. It's a survival mechanism today. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's so many ways to meditate. And of course, some people find yoga useful and some find Tao, Tai Chi and, and um, Qi Kung and Zen and just sitting. I mean, there's so many ways to meditate, but we must meditate because we have to tame that reptilian brain because it's out of control. I mean, just look around you, it's running things. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely running things. January 6th, if that wasn't a movie about the reptilian brain at work, I don't know what is. It's in live, it was in live color. And half of our country is, well, a third of it is in denial about its being, what, significant. And um, so those are a few thoughts about patriarchy. Yeah, I find that so um, 
compelling. One of my favorite topics is is neuroscience and polyvagal theory, mm -hmm. and that's like aligns completely with you mm -hmm. know that reptilian brain and how important it is to know about your own biology. That like that kind of left brained, more masculine mm -hmm. side that wants to control mm -hmm. things takes over when you feel anxious, when you have a trauma trigger, when when things like that happen. Which is exactly what you're trying to do in any contemplative practice is basically make your insides, your whole nervous system, know that you are safe enough to settle into that chaotic space of darkness and like just mystery, like unknowing. You don't know what's there, but to know that you are safe and you are held and it's okay to relax into that, into your parasympathetic nervous system, which is much more of that feminine, receptive, relational part of ourselves. And that's where peace is found. Mm-hmm. So you much, know, even in the midst of chaos, in the midst of disturbance, you know, that and that's why I think it's so valuable today. I'm so glad you're doing that work. And the scientists, too, are are doing that work. And of course, Einstein makes a point that the that values do not come from the rational brain. He says mm. values come from the intuitive brain. That's his name for the right brain. Mm -hmm. I call it the mystical brain. Same thing. Yeah. But he says, um, and look at our education, he says, quote, this is Einstein. I abhor American education, unquote. Why does he say that? Because it only rewards you for the left brain work. You know, I mean, in, in America, whether you're talking grade school or high school or professional school, out goes art when there's a budget crunch, you see. Mm -hmm. And um, as if art is some kind of cherry on the top or something. But art, in fact, is where all our values come from. And it's where we learn to play and where we learn to imagine. And, and all this is the work of the, if you will, the contemplative brain and what you're, you're talking about there. And uh, so I think science, there's one more example where science is an ally today with authentic uh, religious traditions. Tr by that, I mean traditions that know their own tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, the Dalai Lama says the num number one obstacle to interfaith is a bad relationship with one's own faith tradition. And so if we don't even know our mystical tradition, which, as you point out, we rarely do, uh, you know, we're not going to go anywhere in understanding the wisdom of, of Buddhism. And, and the, but this was so wonderful about great mystics in our time who were pioneers in deep ecumenism, like Thomas Merton or Father B. Griffiths, who, of course, talks eloquently about the feminine side of our natures, which are so more developed and appreciated in the East than in the West, because the West had been so busy making empires and, and killing the indigenous people, for example, in the name of Christ, I guess. Uh, the Discovery Doctrine, do you know about that? That horrible 15th century, yeah. three bulls from two popes, which essentially gave Europeans the right to go to Africa and to the New Worlds and um, do whatever they want to do to the people there because these people didn't know Christ. I mean, right. it's just appalling. And I think the Pope should take those documents and burn them in a public event in St. Peter's Square. Now, he doesn't have to burn the original. They could put them under glass in a museum, but burn a, a Xerox copy. Yeah. Make a ritual of it. Right. Burn Seriously, it and burn apologize. It in effigy. <laughs> Start over. What's that? Said What's burn that? it in effigy. <laughs> there you go. Burn it in effigy. Okay. Yeah. We've yeah. done enough of that in the past. <laughs> yeah. Right. Goodness. Oh, yeah. Gosh, I feel like I have like 10 million questions that I want to ask you, and I know we only have a few minutes left. So in the future, we'll have to ask, I'd love to ask more about Aquinas. And mm. I know you're in, um, not too long, you'll be speaking about Julian and Norwich to, to our uh, Women Mystic School, which I'm very excited about. I'm um, excited too. Yeah. One thing, though, that I want to just touch on before um, we close today is, um, I saw that your latest book is is more of an anthology, like put together by um, Charles, is his last name Burak? Burak, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. which feature your essential writings, but it's being released as part of the Modern Spiritual Masters series. And mm -hmm. well, first of all, congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, I'm curious, looking back over your life and all you've gone through and all your writings and teachings and all of that, like how does it, how does it feel to be named a Modern Spiritual Master? <laughs> Well, it's better than some names that I've received. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 
it feels better than that. But you know, I learned I learned a long, long time ago, and, and Eckhart is a great teacher of this, um, not to be over um, impressed by either insults or um, uh, praises. You know, mm. just keep going and yeah. be as close to. Uh, your value system as you can try to live a life of integrity and let the chips fall where they may. So um, I, I just, I would just put it in that category. It's, it's a nice compliment. Compliments are nice, but I'm not attached to them. And, um, uh, or can I say projections, negative projections aren't so nice, but I'm not, a, I try not to be attached to them either. So yeah, yeah. Put them in the same boat. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful thing to be. But able it is to... a nice crew to be with because they've done books on Thich Nhat Hanh and Gandhi and and um, uh, Richard Rohr and, and others, Flannery O'Connor, people who I admire very much. So I'm glad to be in that company. And and frankly, it's the first book by a Catholic publisher uh, in this dared to publish me in maybe 30 years or so. So wow, yeah, yeah, that was one of the. The hard parts of the um, the silencing and expelling of me uh, under Cardinal Ratzinger and the New Inquisition that um, that you're you're excluded. Like I, people told me these stories that when I was uh, whatever I was condemned or something um, that vans drove up to their church library and took out all my books. And, and, and the same thing, they did that at Catholic bookstores. It took out all my books. So, uh, you know, that's been a consequence yeah. of uh, some of the abuse that I've undergone and, um, and 108 of the theologians who I name in my book on the, called The Pope's War because they, they did this something similar to 108 theologians around the world. They killed theology, and that's a quote from a professor at my alma mater, the Institut Catholique in Paris, that under JP2 and, and Benedict XVI, they killed theology, certainly in Europe. Now they're wondering why no one's going to church in Europe. You know, there, there might be a connection. Um, again, it's the control compulsion that, um, that burns heretics. Sure. And... Um, Newness and difference is scary for a it lot of scary. us, especially for our reptilian brains. Well, exactly. And of course, now in our culture, we have whole schools that are throwing books, books, good books, really good books. I want to throw books out of the children's libraries and stuff. You know, this is always part of fascism. It's always fascism is kind of the control compulsion uh, in, a, in its political expression. Mm. And um, as is, of course, um, uh, right-wing religion. Mm -hmm. And and so this control thing, once it, it's like going down a, you know, a, a hill, once it gets going, it really gets going in the culture. Mm -hmm. So the idea that they want to throw Toni Morrison's books out of high school libraries is, is scary. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is a big part of what went on in Germany in the 30s, too. Yeah. So... It's not unfamiliar. It's a deja vu, and we should we should be uh, aware of this and act yeah, important. paying attention. Yep. Yeah, history definitely repeats itself, <laughs> especially when we don't pay attention. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Matthew, if people want to learn more about your work or see all of your numerous books, what where's the best place for them to go? Hmm. Well, my webpage is matthewfox.org. And um, I have a daily meditations with Matthew Fox, which is free and online. So you just go to that daily meditations with Matthew Fox. And um, and just thinking this week, I've been writing about the Black Madonna um, because a friend of mine just came out with, with a new book on the Black Madonna mm. that uh, called God is a Black Woman, uh, Christine Cleveland, wonderful book. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine came out of last year with a book on the Black Madonna, which I wrote the forward to, Healing Journeys with the Black Madonna mm. by Alessandra Bologna, who comes from Southern Italy, where they still have a lot of the Black Madonna rituals going on and everything. Mm. So I mean, the Black Madonna is coming back today. And I mean, I hear a lot of people have told me their dreams. She's coming in their dreams. Mm. I've had experiences with her too, because she's so representative of what 
what we need today for healing. First of all, she's black, so the whole issue of racism is raised there. And of course, we all come from Africa, so the black mother is the grandmother of all of us. But also, she's about the cosmos. She's a cosmic black mother, and uh, she's about grief and suffering, but also about celebration and disturbing the peace, mm -hmm. the false peace. So there's just a lot that she is an archetype about. And, you know, Jung says that archetypes return when we need them. And I really think, I think she's a very important archetype today. So uh, that's what I've been working on the last week or so. But I've also been working in the context of the sacred masculine. We yeah. have this, this distorted masculinity, this tacit masculinity that is patriarchy running the world. But there's a healthy masculine too. And we must team that up with a healthy feminine. And that's why the Black Banana is so important too, that she represents a healthy feminine. And Julian, who was the first to really develop in a richest way of all, the, the idea of God as mother. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's all here too. So but we have to clean up the masculine if you're gonna survive as a species. Mm -hmm. And we have to assert the healthy feminine for the very same reasons and the values that can be found when, when they link up. So one of the chapters, one of my books is on marrying the green man, which is one of the archetypes of the healthy masculine with the black Madonna. We should mm. have a ritual around that. That would be a new level of consciousness for homo sapiens, I think, for our survival. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I, I mean, I feel like we could also talk about that for, for hours too, just <laughs> the archetypes. And um, I think there is such a surging interest in, in the sacred feminine. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this women mystic school, yes. you know, to be able to really affirm just mm -hmm. Both, both the light and the darkness of like the feminine archetype, you know, both the the nurturing, the gentle, the receptive, but also kind of that fierceness. The fierce, absolutely. Um, I yeah, it's incredible to see in so many like Hildegard. Whoa, <laughs> like you know, so many of them were just so, or you know, Catherine yeah. of Siena. I mean. I think basically every female doctor of the church has like told the Pope what they think. <laughs> you know, even even little Therese was like, I'm gonna speak up even if they tell me not to, you know. <laughs> like, That's true. And and Hildegard wrote Pope's letters to the Pope and to the Emperor. She told, she told the Emperor to man up <laughs> and that that pay more attention to justice and all that quit being like a baby. She said this to the Emperor, whom she had met once, in fact. Yeah. So uh anyway, yeah, the, these these women are are so important and they they can help to empower uh, women and healthy men today as well yes absolutely if anyone listening wants to join us for the women mystic school check out womenmystics.org and feel free to join us uh, matthew's live class will be on may 7th on julina norwich and i'm very excited to hear it well, and I'm anybody who wants to join us school. later it'll be recorded too so that's great i'm glad yeah. you school like that yeah yeah well matthew thank you so much for joining us today i feel like i i was scribbling notes as you were speaking but i feel like i'm gonna have to listen to this again <laughs> because oh. there's just so much in it so well, thank you for thank sharing you. Mm -hmm. okay i hope i didn't talk too much no it was wonderful <laughs> the questions are good and they got me going <laughs> yeah yeah no we appreciate you joining us today so thank you